Welcome to the Skift Podcast, weekly conversations on global travel trend lines. Anyone who works in the travel industry knows that travel isn't immune from tragedy. When the unexpected strikes, how do destinations respond? How are they hurt? When is it okay to urge people to return? And what's the best way to do that? Today, we're talking about the question of marketing and selling travel in a time of crisis. Whether that means vacations to Paris after the recent terror attacks, or cruises in the Caribbean in the midst of a Zika outbreak. Those are only the most immediate pressing issues, but even recent history is full of examples. Ebola in West Africa, tsunamis in Japan, and Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, and of course the September 11th attacks in New York City and Washington, D.C. Today, we're joined by longtime travel agent Yaron Yarimi, who has reassured or redirected customers around trouble spots for more than two decades. And we have Christine Nicholas, who is president and CEO of NYC and Company, the tourism and marketing organization for New York City between 1999 and 2006. She's now co-founder and CEO of Nicholas and Lenz Communications, a strategic communications firm. They're here at the Skift office with me, Hannah Sampson, and reporter Dan Peltier. Yaron, let's ask you the first question. What are the biggest concerns that you're hearing about from your clients these days? Um, I think that the, um, the biggest concern is probably terrorist attacks around the world, probably more so than anything else. So I would say that's probably uh, front center now. Is Are you hearing about Paris specifically, um, other parts of the world, Turkey? Um, is it just the concern that there is an unexpected element so um, people aren't really sure where they'll be safe? Well, I think that uh, probably Europe is, is mostly affected now. So um, in general, I think um, Americans are quite um, unsettled about traveling to Europe. Um, especially France, um, but then it changes now that in the last few days we had some issues with bombings in Turkey, then that sort of become uh, the focus, you know. And from your perspective, what, what can you say either to reassure people or how do you help them with their planning uh, when they have so much uncertainty? Well, I mean, you, you try to put everything in perspective and, 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 explain that, um, you know, things are happening everywhere. And um, I mean, it, it really so much of it depends on, on the person with whom you're speaking. Um, so, some, I mean, you try, you certainly try to, because we're not nervous to travel. So we certainly try to sort of give them that reassurance and tell them that, you know, just because you are traveling to a destination where things have happened doesn't mean that that something would happen to to you or that you know for except for example the the problems that are happening in israel and i just traveled to israel about three weeks ago um they've had a lot of stabbings going on and people were very concerned about traveling to israel but the targeting of the of the of the stabbings are mainly um towards uh, military personnel and also very uh, religious. Um, religious, I'm, I'm, I mean in appearance, you know, uh, Orthodox Jews, uh, because that's where the anger, um, the, the, the anger is really directed towards those two groups. So you have to, you know, so oftentimes you have to explain that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. I mean, people, just, you know, sometimes you start a conversation, somebody would say, no, 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 I'm not going, you know, and, and other times people are willing to listen. And do you, this for either of you, do you, do you think it's more of, um, an unexpected, the, the question of there being an unexpected attack that is wor that worries people or could a, a natural disaster be more of a discouraging factor or an outbreak of illness like Ebola in West Africa? Where do you think um, the spectrum is in terms of what really scares people away and what takes the most work to recover from? Well, I can only speak from the experience that I 
personally had, which is 9-11. And, you know, one thing that we noticed right away is meetings were being canceled. Um, we had a lot of events coming up. They were being canceled. So I'll never forget that the day after 9-11, on September 12th, Mayor Giuliani converged a whole group of people who were involved with the business of New York City. So you had the head of the stock exchange, you had all the real estate folks, you had bankers, you had um, arts and tourism. So he said to me, how soon can you open up Broadway? And I said, maybe in a week or so. He said, you mean like maybe tomorrow? <laughs> I said, yes, I mean like maybe tomorrow. <laughs> and sure enough, I then from that meeting had to go straight to the Schubert Theater. I had to meet with union leaders, actors, folks that would be performing. And they said, well, how can we possibly perform if we can't get into the city because they had closed down the bridges? So I got that message back to the mayor. So he went on the air and said, if there are any performers, just show your ID, show a playbill, show whatever it takes to get in, and we will make sure that the show goes on. And, you know, the reason why he did that was to reassure the public. It was also to fight back against terrorism, to show that uh, they were not successful, although they took many lives and it was a terrible time for our city and we were all in mourning. We had to make sure that we continued on. And what that prompted even though people were feeling skittish and some people did cancel, it prompted patriotic tourism. So what we had was busloads of people. Uh, we had a group from Oregon. They had 900 people come in in October, and it was during the Columbus Day Parade, which was the first parade after September 11th. So we ended up putting them into the parade so that national TV showed these people wearing I Love New York or Oregon Loves New York, and that just prompted other people from all over the world wanting to come to New York to show their support. So in a sense, although the tourism numbers took a couple of years to get back to where we were, it was a sense of pride to become a tourist to New York. So it actually worked against the, uh, you know, the ambitions of the terrorists. Yeah, but, but you see the difference when you have that emotional kind of, you know, when you were... You know, it's the same with what's happened in Boston and what's happened, you know, for the Parisians, what's happened in Paris. Of course, they're reacting the same way. But when there's not that sort of conviction or, or, or like that sort of emotional attachment and people are just, well, you know, I won't travel because they don't really feel that they have to. You know what I mean? We're here. You have a situation where people feel that you know, they want to bring business back. They want to bring tourism back. So, yeah. Yeah. How much of what um, was happening right after 9-11 was the city taking steps to say we're open for business? And how much of it was an actual targeted marketing campaign initially? Well, the question we had internally was, when is it too soon to market the city? Is it insensitive? So we went with the first, our first campaign was very soft. It was full page ads in almost um, all the newspapers here in New York. But then what was nice is newspapers around the country also gave us free space where it said New Yorkers want to thank you in person. So it was another soft push that yes, we're very appreciative of what everybody's doing for us but we want you to come. And then after that, we put together, uh, at the direction of Mayor Giuliani, these ads called the Miracle Ads. And um, BBD&O, I think was the, the, they were the creative. John Osborne worked on it very closely, but they were a number of celebrities that did these 30-second ads that um, were farcical. So you had a skater at Rockefeller Center because the Rock Center rink is so iconically New York. And he, he's wearing khakis and a jacket, so you can't really tell who it is. And he's doing these triple axles. And and then when it did the pan the close-up, it was Woody Allen, you know, and he <laughs> said, hey, I have a dream, you know. And, and then the other one was somebody running the bases at Yankee Stadium in a suit, and he slides into home, and then he lifts his face up and it's Henry Kissinger, you know, so it was very funny, you know, and it was time to laugh. Mayor Giuliani also went on Saturday Night Live because we know what kind of power that has. And it was a somber start. He had all the firefighters and police officers with him. But, and Lorne Michaels said, 
uh, Mayor, is it okay for us to laugh? Is it okay for us to, t you know, be funny again? And he said, Lauren, you haven't been funny for 20 years. Why start now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. You kind of touched on something um, a few seconds ago. You know, how soon do you feel comfortable um, encouraging people to return to a destination? Um, is there is there a proper amount of time that you can wait? Is there like a one size fits all solution or does it vary? And something that I'm thinking unrelated to 9-11 that you were just talking about, um, I'm thinking back to a year ago with the Ebola crisis in West Africa, I um, had covered Brussels Airlines. Um, they did a launched a big, huge marketing campaign because um, they service several of the destinations that were impacted as well as the broader African continent. Um, basically saying, you know, their tagline was Africa is not Ebola. Um, so they were really rallying behind this idea that, um, you know, we still service dozens of other cities on this continent that are hundreds, thousands of miles away. Um, and then you also saw South Africa tourism and Kenya tourism that were further away from the epidemic area than, say, Miami, Florida, which was um, further away. Um, so just just thinking of that in mind, and then even with um, Paris that just happened um, a few months ago, um, I haven't seen many brands come back and, and start encouraging. Maybe that's because Paris is a different caliber, of course, of a destination than West Africa or even South Africa. So that was just an observation I made, but I'm interested to hear um, your thoughts on I, I don't think it's one size fits all. I think it's a case by case basis. And if there is a serious crisis that is impacting public health, I think you have to look towards the experts to really give you the definitive answer of when it is safe. And if the U.S. government is also putting a country on a restricted travel list, um, I'm not a travel agent, but I'm, I think as a PR representative, I would have a hard time, you know, promoting that when we know for sure that there is danger there. I will give you a, a different example, though, which was when the BP oil spill happened in the South Coast region of the U.S. We represented those four states and uh, about 14 beach communities along there. And, you know, there were pictures of, uh, you know, selected photos of some oil spillage. But when you looked out, the vast beaches were clean. They were white sand beaches. They were gorgeous. And this was really in a contained area. And you were able to you know, see where the oil was. We gave it a couple of, uh, unlike 9-11, we did have to give it a couple of weeks in order to get the permission for people to go swimming again. But we did promote the area that there's more than just the beach. And then what was terrific is when it was safe and the waters were clean, and it was only a matter of weeks, Jimmy Buffett did a free live concert, which was aired on Country Music Channel and a number of other stations that was right on the beach. It showed that it was clean. They showed people swimming. And their tourism now is much higher than it has ever been historically, I think, because of the outreach and the push. You run from a travel agent perspective. Um, do you... Like, at what point do you feel comfortable telling someone, no, you know, Brussels, Brussels should be okay, or um, West Africa, you know, Ebola is not um, a crisis anymore, or none of those examples, but any other place that has been a trouble spot, um, do you go through a certain checklist in your mind? Or yeah. Well, you know, with, with, with Africa as a, as, as a continent... Um, you know, I think people make certain associations, you know, they hear that the country in, you know, a particular country, they don't, they don't understand that West Africa is so totally different from South Africa. And we have a lot of ground operators that we work with, and they were really hit so hard by people not going and doing safaris in South Africa because of what's happened in West Africa. And then you have, you know, the whole safari experience in East Africa and Tanzania and Kenya, which was, those were also countries that were not affected. But it's very difficult because, we, as as I mentioned before, the same with Morocco. People feel that it's, it's a wonderful country, but people feel because they speak Arabic, because they're Muslim, then right away there's that association with the Middle East. So it's 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 tough. It's tough, but I mean, we speak with the clients and do our best to to explain that um, you know it's totally safe. And I mean, we really encourage everyone to travel everywhere, unless it's really a situation where you're putting somebody someone in danger. But that 
I mean, it doesn't really, I, I can't remember. Um, I mean, obviously we won't send anybody to Syria now, <laughs> you know, so, uh, but the, but it, it is really widespread and people really, I mean, it's not very logical in a way that people, how people think of why they will not go to a specific, specific country. I mean, and, it, and sometimes it's, to us, it sounds very ridiculous, but. One of the important things for a destination, which is heavily steeped in tourism to do is be out there, be truthful, um, be reassuring, but always speak, you know, get the answers. When you look at what happened in the South Coast of USA, and then you also look at 9-11, you had strong leadership. So when you look at a, a different type of crises, but there was a terrible murder uh, unresolved for many years down in Aruba, you know, with a young woman from Alabama. She was on a school trip. But the way the government handled that case was so botched that it gave, I think, Americans and others the sense that if something happens to me down there, I'm, I'm you know, the, the government's not on my side, right? So, and I think people have the savviness that they will feel, they need to feel safe, but they can make their choice. So, you know, that was a example that their tourism has been suffering since that one incident, which was isolated. It, it could have been, you know, handled so much better. It wasn't. It lasted for years with the trial. And, uh, you know, so it's just an example that leadership matters. Mm -hmm. But also there's so much misinformation by the media because they sort of focus on one thing and they just talk about it, but they never take time to say, you know, it is really happening in West Africa, but there's no reason for anyone to, for any concern to travel to the rest of the continent. And I think sometimes if they sort of reinforce that, I think people, I mean, it's, it's, it's good because I think people can better understand and, you know, it's anything, any fear of anything, if you can explain it. And I just think that it's, it just gets so hyped and, you know, so that's I why you that's need a, a strong PR firm. <laughs> <laughs> I was, both both of you are talking about, um, you know, encouraging and playing up like the good aspects of, of why you should come. But there's also this this thing called disaster tourism, as odd as it might sound. People who, for example, maybe shortly after 9-11, you know, wanted to return to Ground Zero or visit Ground Zero, um, probably New Orleans as well, for whatever reason, maybe they had a personal connection or they were just interested. Um, uh, what kind of trends have you seen around that? People that intentionally, in, because of disaster, are, are considering visiting someplace, whereas before it wasn't really on their radar? Well, um, when we had thousands and thousands of people coming down to Ground Zero, they were actually, uh, they had good intentions. I believe they were paying their respects. It really wasn't, you know, garish as much as they were trying to do something proper. But they were getting in the way. They were getting in the way from the recovery of the remains. They were getting in the way of the construction. So um, David Rockwell, who's a famous architect here in New York, he came to me when at NYC and company said, uh, we have a plan and we want to build a platform. And it was done tastefully. We didn't get any criticism for it. You know, if anyone had said, why are you doing this? Why are you making a platform? We explained it's really, you know, it's, it's a nice way of people to be able to go pay their respects in a dignified fashion and also keep out of the way. So, But you yeah. also see so many people, I mean, you know, with New Orleans, I mean, it's unbelievable how many people are now going. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's even more popular than it was before. And then people coming to New York always want to, you know, they always ask about going to Ground Zero and visiting the museum, and um, you see that also with Cuba now. Everybody feels that, you know, it's it's safe to go, and it's, I mean, it's just, it's really incredible how it becomes even more popular when there are changes, when, when In Vietnam as well, you know, when Vietnam opened up for tourism, you know, yeah. about 10, 15 years ago, yeah. people really wanted to, to go there to see yeah. what it was like. For I sure. just went to Cuba for the first time, you know, back in June. I went with the New York Cosmos because they were playing against the Cuban national team. And it was right around the time when the president was opening up relations with Cuba again. 
but there's a sense of urgency to get there before they change everything. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for I, sure. I, I, I don't sense it's going to change rapidly, but it, it, you know, maybe you should go in the next five years. I don't expect there's going to be a McDonald's there anytime soon, but who knows? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> um, you talked about Jimmy Buffett and um, and the the ads featuring Woody Allen and Henry Kissinger. I know there were um, a couple of big benefit concerts in New York City in 2011. How important are those partnerships or maybe kind of those seals of approval from well-known people in terms of um, getting your message out or swaying public sentiment that might still be on the fence? And your own, I don't know if you've seen um, anything along those lines also for any destinations that that you work with, but um, what do you think? You know, people, uh, they trust they're, you know, some celebrities, they want to see where they're going. I mean, when you look at Cuba, as we were discussing, when Jay-Z and Beyonce, Beyonce when yeah. they went, uh, that all of a sudden there was a cool factor with going and everybody wanted to go because they went. Uh, you know, in New York, we're fortunate because we have so many celebrities that live here. Robert De Niro, Ben Stiller, they were all uh, helpful. In fact, we had so many, we, we couldn't fit them all in the ads. But in the case of Africa, perhaps, there are some celebrities that do go there, even, uh, you know, especially for safari. Perhaps you'd want to enlist them to be spokespersons, to really, you know, show by example. It's one thing to say to go. You know, it's easy to do that. You could do that from an armchair in an office. But to get on that plane and go, um, when I, one, of the, uh, one of the highlights of my career when I was heading up New York City tourism is when um, the Concord was going back into service after that unfortunate tragedy, they needed folks to go on the plane, <laughs> you know, that first flight. So they called me and I said, I always wanted to go on the Concord. But when I was sitting on the runway and we were taking off, I was thinking, this was crazy. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> you know? But then when we were up and at 50,000 feet, I said, wow, this is really cool. And you see yeah. the, and you saw the curvature. You saw the curvature, the earth, right? yeah. Is, but that's incredible. what it took for the Concorde. They had a whole plane full of travel um, spokespersons, you know, people that can really explain. Was that Air France or British Airways? It was British Airways. Air France was the plane that crashed, but right, British Airways Germany. was, everything was, was yeah. um, everything was shut down. The Concorde was shut down after yeah. that, both British Airways and Air France. So I reckon, unfortunately, they're no longer running, but it was, yeah. it was well, cool. Well, they're bringing it back, I think, or, or different, not, not the actual Concorde, but another, uh, A similar experience. Yeah. Similar experience. I, think. I wonder if you, Christine, um, look at a situation that is unfolding and 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 either cringe or just like come up with ideas like yeah I, you need to be doing x y or z what what are some maybe general lessons from from what you learned in your time after 911 here that you think can apply to other destinations that are having some kind of a crisis well in any crises in any situation when you have crisis communication you have to be swift with the information, truthful with the information. More information is better, even if even if it unfolds later that the information may not have been correct. Address the mistake. I'll, just two quick examples, and they happened with when I was working for Mayor Giuliani in City Hall. One was Flight 800, TWA 800, which was taking off at JFK. It was a 747. It crashed. It had a lot of kids on that plane because they were going to a France uh, a trip, high school kids from Montoursville, Pennsylvania. It was such a tragedy. But the tragedy was compounded by the way TWA handled the situation. They refused to um, admit or release the manifest of the passengers. So there were people that weren't sure if their loved ones were on the plane. We, we were one of the first to the airport, and Mayor Giuliani called the head of TWA at the time. And he said, well, we'll liaise with you in the morning. And he said, what do you mean you'll liaise with me in the morning? We've got a group of, you know, 600 people out here wanting to know if their relatives were on that plane. And, and they said, well, we'll get back to you in the morning. Well, all the news crews were there. The mayor said that. And, he, uh, sure, and sure enough, it took 
until seven in the morning the next day for TWA personnel to get there. And so the mayor was saying, well, what, you don't have another plane that you can have your executive? There was no leadership on the ground. There was a vacuum, and what filled that vacuum was negativity and anger and resentment towards the airline. There was another crash shortly thereafter by Swissair. Um, they had a, a fire on board, and they crashed, I think, over In Halifax. The, yeah. Halifax, right. The folks from Swissair were there right away. They were giving condolences to the family. They had their top personnel to meet the family. It was... So it was so well handled, and they were similar situations that you, no one really remembers the Swiss Air flight, but everybody here, at least in New York, they will remember TWA 800. Mm. Yaron, are there any destinations that you think could really use some advice right now, or um, any places that you still have a hard time selling that, that you think, man, they need a strategy? Well, I can't think of anything, you know, because we have, uh, you know, we have client, you know, we have different clients and everyone feels differently about traveling. Some people are not concerned about the same thing, thing that others are concerned about. But I can also can think of I mean, right now. I think um, what's been of concern is most recently is probably Zika. So, um, you know, you. Um, People understand also that um, that you know it's more more of a concern for pregnant women. So it's not it's not that bad. I mean, I, I certainly can think of other situations that where it was a lot worse and people were just not going at all. But uh, but I can't think of anything. I mean, I think Paris is sort of like behind us now. Turkey is sort of like you know in the last few days. Um, people talking about that, but it's also not, um, it's not the season yet. Mm. So I think if it, if it, if it happens in July and August, then you're going to have a lot more people calling to, to want to cancel or, you know, can you change, change it to a different destination? So that, that can, can also be a reason why when, where, why there's not a lot of exposure to that now. Mm -hmm. One of my colleagues today actually wrote a story about Zika and how what's happening has kind of followed a familiar pattern before. And he touched on how Zika is kind of impacting parts of Brazil. Um, and of course, we have the Olympics coming up this summer. And the fear is if, um, you know, the epidemic keeps spreading, that airlines might cancel service. And of course, anyone who wanted to go to the Olympics could um, could be in a tough spot. Um I guess just the issue of Brazil and Brazil has had problems with getting itself and specifically Rio together before these Olympics, you know, in general, is there any insight down there into what could happen and maybe how brands will respond? So I haven't really had anyone inquiring about the Olympics yet. So maybe that's why I just don't really have a lot of experience with that. Um, but you know, when, when they had, they had the same issue with the mosquito in the Caribbean, in St. Bart's and St. Martin, I think, uh, I can't remember the name of that mosquito. They didn't call it Zika, it was a different name. Is this but the chikungunya I, yes, situation? Yes, yeah. but they had another name for it. And I, But I traveled and I know a lot of my clients traveled and then there were of course some people that, that did not travel, so. <laughs> yeah, and, and Christine, you talked about having information and, and, and being upfront with information, but with something like Zika, I think there's still a lot of questions. So it's maybe hard to, maybe the information is, you know, we still have a lot of questions, but here's what we can tell you. Right. Yeah. We haven't heard a lot of information from doctors directly, right? It's been, um, you know, from newscasters, I, I, you know, I haven't really seen the doctors address it. I haven't seen, you know, the administration address it per se. Uh, we happen to represent uh, the Milrose Games, which is taking place in New York, and that is a run up to Rio. So you have all of these Olympic athletes that are going to be performing the track and field. And we were at the press conference yesterday, and the question came up, and there were a lot of Olympians. So you know, the, their answer was basically, let me get on the Olympic team and then worry about it. Uh, 
we probably all saw the news that Hope Solo has said that she does not plan on going to the Olympics. She's the famous goalie uh, because she's trying to get pregnant. So it's going to be a personal choice. My, and I am not a doctor, but my hope is that they already have some kind of, you know, remedy or uh, antidote. I don't know. I, well, they're telling us really that if you're not, if you're not planning on getting pregnant, that you really, I mean, you know, it's obviously not a pleasant experience to, to have, the, but it's not life threatening or, but also I just got a call yesterday from a hotel in, in, in do you know Cap Jaluca in Anguilla? In Anguilla. Mm. No. It's a five-star property. They've been around for, for a very long time, probably one of the top um, resorts in the Caribbean. And they're saying that, uh, they, I mean, we haven't heard, but they said that a lot of people are canceling because of Zika. And I don't know now how the Caribbean is affected by that because I thought I thought that's, that was something that we had a few years ago and and it's gone now and now it's South America, but apparently even travel to the Caribbean is affected. But I haven't heard it from my clients. I heard it from a hotel person, so. So it sounds like this is still a developing situation that nobody's quite ahead of. Maybe point. they should start marketing to groups that would not be necessarily in that phase of getting pregnant. So maybe senior citizens or... Yeah, yeah but I have a family. Great I have points. a family of, I have a family of two, two adults, three kids, the wife is not planning on getting pregnant again. They're going to Costa Rica. There was one case in Costa Rica, and they were thinking about canceling. And as I was speaking with the client, I, you know, I asked him what his concerns were because obviously it's not that his wife is getting pregnant. But you know, I, I was trying to hear from him what what his concerns are, and he. He told me, well, you know, I mean, there's the, the, what you get like a red eye or do you get like yeah. a red eye or something? From that? But, yeah, exactly. And he, was, and he was concerned about that. So, you know, but, but I think, but I think there's also, it's sort of new. So it hasn't been around that. And I think a lot of people are concerned, well, what if they find that other things could happen? And what if later on there are complications? So I think that it's so new that, People are just thinking, you know, the thing with, with, with outbreaks like that, I think it really freaks people out. Well, we're going to because, Puerto Rico. So, yeah, so <laughs> my family of uh, five, where we've already booked, I'm just kicking myself because I bet the hotel's probably going down in price. <laughs> <laughs> Have you bought your bug spray? <laughs> Well, guys, thank you both so much for sharing your experiences and your insight. Um, it's really interesting, and we really appreciate having you here. Thank you. Great. Pleasure.